I was young and naive, and I thought this whole investing thing was easy. It's going to catch up to you one day or the other. I've been very short term and like fast reward. I mean, it's a hundred thousand dollar mistake. Got burned early on. Smoke and mirrors everywhere. You guys know it's just not that easy, right? Biggest failure to date. Not a good thing to do. You know, you never count your eggs before they hatch. Not just taboo with my family. I think it's taboo with a lot of people. And John Merrill, I'm 25 years old and I live born and raised in Miami, Florida. Awesome, John. And what do you do for work? Personal assistant to a family. Uh, I guess that would be my main gig, but I model and I also uh, have a clothing brand that I run. Nice. Okay. And what is the income breakdown between those personal assistant for this family i would say that's my main job uh breakdown would probably be 60 30 10 between 60 being my personal assisting uh 30 would be my clothing brand which i actually don't take any profits from i just reinvest and then modeling is um becoming more mainstream for me but it is just kind of like a side gig right now but i do take funds from that to just invest and uh you know daily expenses and stuff and what is the gross annual income for each of those right now i would say total gross is uh 85 total net incomes probably around 65 60 to 65 and so how long have you been doing all these different things? I've So the clothing brand I launched, it's called Fictional Affluence. So a little backstory. It's kind of a play off Miami. I don't know if you've ever been, if any of your followers have ever been. There's a lot of smoke and mirrors in Miami, especially regarding finances. So there's a lot of fictional affluence. Um, so it's, it's a... It's a joke. And, but yeah, that's a little background on that. And I've launched that in May of 2021. So two and a half years. And then I've been with this family that I work hand in hand for since August of 2020. I uh, started my MBA in August of 2020 and then started working with this family at the same time. And then modeling, I've been modeling for about six months now with my agency. Nice. Okay. So you're on track. You're about 30% towards modeling on track to make about 20,000 this year for modeling between 15 and 20. Yeah. Awesome. That's exciting. Six months into it. Yeah. And background on the MBA. Have you finished your MBA? Are you still working on your MBA? I actually got my MBA in finance. I graduated in May of 2020. No, sorry. May of 2020, uh, 2023. Nice. Well, congratulations on graduating there. Thank you. Thank you. It's exciting. What are your plans to do that MBA? So I'm uh, clearly, I do a little bit of everything right now. I am interviewing right now for corporate sales positions. My passion is sales. I got my undergrad in finance and I graduated uh, December of 2020 from my undergrad. The whole world shut down. I graduated from my kitchen a couple of steps away right here. So I didn't really know what to do. And I was advised to just get my MBA. So I just went straight back next semester and I got my MBA in finance. I would say finance is is fun. I, I wouldn't say it's my passion. And I'm, I'm glad you invited me to be on here because even as a guy with an MBA in finance, I feel like I still have a ton to learn. And um, it's such a kind of a vast field. So, but yeah, long story short, I think I'm going to take my MBA in finance and actually transition into corporate sales, probably tech sales. A lot of opportunities in the world of sales. How would you rate yourself on a scale of one to 10? One being horrific financial situation, 10 being picture perfect financial situation. Uh, I would have to, I'm, I would have to say I'm pretty stingy to be honest with you. I feel like my income has gone up in the last year, two years, I've really started, you know, with steady income and I feel like my expenses have kind of stayed the same. So I'm proud of that. I would say I'd, I'd give myself some good credit. Um, I think I could make more money, obviously, but I think that just comes with time and choosing an, a career path with growth. But I would say I, I got to give myself a seven, eight, somewhere up there for sure. I think I'm excited to talk to you about budgeting. I think I need to budget more and kind of put a, a strict plan together, but I would say I'm, I'm, I save a lot. I don't spend a lot. So I would say seven, eight on the one to 10 scale. Debts. Do we have any debts right now? None. Beautiful. That's why I like to hear 25 years old, debt-free. I hope it stays that way for the future minus mortgage debt. Okay. And then on the asset side of things, what assets do we have? Uh, I would say my biggest asset is a Rolex. I bought myself for graduation, um, and that was that was um, undergrad graduation. So that was kind of the peak of the whole Rolex, um, and it probably doubled in price the day I walked out of the store. I have not sold it, and I don't plan on selling it, but 
I would say that's my biggest asset at the moment. I don't own property yet, um, but I would say that's my big, biggest one physical asset. And then my cash investments. Okay. And Rolex, how much did you buy it for? What would you estimate it's worth today? I bought it for 9200 and I would say it's worth 16, 17 grand right now. It's a nice uh, graduation gift to yourself. Big boy purchase. Paid cash for it? Uh, credit and then paid it off. How long did it take you to pay it off? Oh, immediately. I had... Okay, so you paid off. Okay, so basically you paid it off in the same statement. Okay. Correct. Yeah. And then investments. What what in other investments do we have? Uh, stocks. Just I have a friend who's kind of my financial advisor. Um, best friend of mine, but he's he's just like all into stocks, all into everything. I trust him with everything. So he um, kind of tells you what to pick. And, you know, the, I feel like the whole market kind of stuff hit the fan the last two years or so, but um, it's a long game for me. So just stocks. And what was the total value of your stock portfolio right now? $75,000. You know what your cost basis is on that? Uh, I'm down like 10% right now. Okay, so you invested eighty two thousand, and you're at about seventy five thousand now. Okay, total investments. So you're investing probably peak SPAC season, peak tech stocks back in twenty twenty one. Throughout that, obviously, there's been a lot of uh, roller coasters of that. But honestly, my biggest failure to date, I would, and it's it's just something fun to talk about. I was up a hundred and ten percent on Norwegian Cruise Line, and it was just a random stock I picked, and I it just skyrocketed like at the beginning of COVID and I was young and naive and I thought this whole investing thing was easy. I was like, I'm up 110%. Of course. Like I was just looking back on it, just dumb. I remember the day I was talking to this guy's dad and he's like, you guys know, it's just not that easy. Right. Cause he's a long time investor, big, big portfolio. He's like, you know, it's just not that easy. I was like, it is that easy. This is my, my first stock. I'm up 110%. I didn't pull out I was thinking, what am I going to buy? I ended up cashing out, I think, up 7%. It's it's a roller coaster. And I, I'm trying to pull up where I was at because I, I definitely got caught up in the, um, when COVID, I bought a bunch of um, stocks, single stocks. I got caught up in the cruise line stuff. I got caught up in some of the tech stocks. Um, I bought, yeah, I guess when I bought um, Norwegian, I bought a bunch of shares at $8. I mean, it was only about 1000 Oh, I guess about $2,000 worth of Norwegian stock between March 19th and March 30th of 2020. So right after COVID, everything happened. Yep. Um, so I was in the same boat as you and then ended up climbing to within two months, climbed to $30. So I was up from a thousand to $3,000 or so. And now it's, I think I ended up selling it last couple months ago. Um, still made a profit on it, but I decided that, Hey, I'm not going to time the market perfectly with single stocks. So I'm going to cut my losses down from the peak, but I don't have faith in, or I'm not going to know what's going to happen with this moving forward. So I, I moved train. I've transitioned from, Hey, let's try single stocks, which I tried to make in some money. I was up on some, I also lost my butt on a ton, um, and moved towards the ETF index fund model where, Hey, I'm going to be betting on total U S stock market. I'm going to be betting on an international fund why it might be a growth fund, a tech fund, um, ETF that's just all tracking indexes. And uh, I'm going to have a lot more success with that because I'm not the next Warren Buffett. So I would say I've definitely feel you've been in the exact same spot with, uh, I think a lot of us got caught up and thought we can be the next Warren Buffett. We can make, we can outperform the S&P 500. Let's get into uh, single stocks. And I know a lot of people have lost a lot of money. I've known a lot of people that have made a lot of money, but then I also equally know a lot more people that have lost money trying to play that game. So yeah, absolutely. Lately, I've been kind of, I guess it's, the market, my stocks have been making a clawback, but I have most of my money in just Robinhood gold. You get like 4.9% interest on uninvested cash. And that's kind of what I've been doing just at least until for my next play. But I just have a lot of my liquid cash just there um, earning almost 5%. Yeah. That's a good route to go. I mean, Vanguard, Charles Schwab, Robinhood, I, I don't have a Robinhood account anymore. But Vanguard, Charles probably do the same thing. Have money market funds they can earn four and a half, five percent um, while it's sitting there. So um, or high yield savings account too. But great. So seventy five thousand in investments, six thousand, sixty thousand dollar Rolex, and how much do we have in our checking savings account? I honestly, and I, you know, I'm here to learn. I, I don't, I don't keep. I think I use, I, I don't use it because I live very you know, frugally at times, but I use my kind of that Robin Hood account, the uninvested cash as kind of like a savings account. Uh, I don't keep too much in 
just a regular checking account. Just, I think it's inflation's just stealing from me. Um, so I would say probably $5,000 in checking. That's, um, I'm more of a fan of, Hey, separate the investments from the checking account operating stuff. So you're not saying, Hey, I'm gonna pull stuff from Robinhood. Um, what I do personally is yes, I ha I'll have cash in my investment accounts that are sending money market funds or while I'm waiting to buy our dollar costing averaging in. But on the side, I have a high yield savings account. I think it's with Marcus. It's 4.5%, I think, interest on it right now. And I have my emergency fund sitting in there and I don't touch it. That's just for six months of emergency fund. Keep it in there, set it away, forget about it. And that's when roof breaks, needs to be replaced or AC goes out or something. Make sure I have funds stayed away for that. Uh, but I definitely would, I'm not a fan of mixing the investments and like the emergency fund checking account because then you might get in a habit of, oh, I got 75K in here, might however much is in cash, start pulling from it. Next month, start pulling some more and just try to have those completely separate so you don't create a habit of that. How quickly can you get that money? Next day, typically. Oh, yeah. it's, it's typically 24 to 72 hours, business days, obviously. Um, but I've I've moved money in there and moved money out of there in two days, easily right. so. And typically, a lot the different savings accounts also don't have, um, some of them have like certain number of transfers in a statement period, so yeah. you can't transfer in and out like 60 right. times. But you can do some of them are a couple of times, some of them are like 10 times. Um, but you definitely can't run like your debit card in and out of that every single day. Usually they're typically pretty, pretty flexible and pretty quick. So gotcha. But net worth ninety six thousand dollars at twenty-five years old. It's pretty awesome. Thank you. No debt. So um that's a great spot to be in. And that means I mean, if you just continue to live below your means, invest a difference. If you earn an average of we'll call it seven percent rate of return and don't even invest an extra dollar. Do you know how much money it would be worth when you're 67? Compound interest is, is a powerful tool. I don't know. Do the math for me. Yeah, so if from 25 to 67, you start with $75,000 in it right now, which is what you have. It grow to $1.4 million at a 7% annual rate of return. And that's not contributing another dime to it, which that's pretty pretty awesome. And if you contribute $1,000 a month, that's $4.5 million. Wow. So yeah. that just shows compound interest. And just continue to add money to it every single month. Um, and with your current income and looking at your expenses, $1,000 a month is definitely attainable to be doing right now. Mm -hmm. And now your future career goals, it sounds like sales, corporate America is where you want to go. Uh, I mean, entrepreneurship is fun and all, but I think I, I want not even the stability, but just, I guess, uh, a path. And I think, I think I have the mindset that I'm going to go into corporate America and kind of soak up as much as I can for five years and then see where it takes me, whether it takes me back to entrepreneurship or whether it, I, you know, I fall in love with it and just, you know, work hard and do where I can take it. So I'm, I'm excited for the future, whether it, it, it is in corporate America, like I said, I'm interviewing right now. Um, but yeah, I guess you can say I'm transitioning into corporate America now. And that's what life's about. Figure out what you want to do, learn as much as possible and you have the ability if you live below your means and start saving money that, okay, five years from now, you can continue your clothing brand, you can continue modeling. Um, and if one of those pick up and say, hey, I don't want to do corporate America, you can do that. But you, at least you're giving yourself options and you're going to learn in the world of finance and the world of sales. If you can go do sales for corporate America and sell a lot of whatever you're selling, you can do well in any job. So what, um, what financial goals do you have related to your career? Financial goals. It's funny because the last, like, I'd say two months, I've really taken a step back and done like some personal reflection on actually setting goals for the future. And I think I'm still on that. I know two months might be a long time, but I'm still trying to kind of picture I've, I've been very short term and like fast reward, um, I guess throughout college. And now I'm kind of like, taking a step back and ready to, you know, build this plan. And I think that's why I'm excited for corporate America because it might be a step back from what I'm doing entrepreneurially. Um, but yeah, so like long-term goals, um, I don't know, other than like superficial things, I, I don't really know. I mean, I have, I have things that I'd love to have, but just like I said, superficially, um, but I don't know, I don't have like this number or oh, I want to have this saved up. I think just to be able to, I think what I'm doing now, I'm, I'm very comfortable living within my means. I have what I need. I think that's what, that's what's powerful is having what you need. And you, I think if you live be below your means, you can see how little you actually need. You know, you don't need everything. You can be happy with, with bare necessities sometimes. Yeah, no, de definitely agree. And, um, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't look either at corporate America that, hey, this is a step back. It's time to learn, time to grow. And basically what you can do too, hopefully with whatever you're doing is you can replace the current personal assistant job that you're doing for that family with this role 
but you can still do your modeling on the side. You can still be doing your clothing brand. So you still have those entrepreneurial aspects of your life that, hey, you're making it as an independent contractor, freelance, whatever, do it on the modeling side. And then you have your clothing brand that you're trying to grow as well. Yeah, um, so you still it. have aspects of that and you're learning whole new skill sets, whole different um, everything with that. So exactly. Well, let's talk about financial upbringing, childhood. Where did you grow up and how was, what was your childhood like? Uh, so talk about like, I think how I live below my means. My mom grew up in rural Georgia, so still mountain, but she would go out to like the countryside each, each weekend. So she lived very humble beginnings and my dad grew up on a farm in Iowa. So I, myself and my sister, we grew up in Miami beach. So a complete difference, you know, Ferraris everywhere and just total different upbringing. But that being said, I think I'm still rooted in the kind of small town America and humble beginnings that my parents had. And I had a great childhood, like I, you know, great childhood. I would say very lucky. I had everything I needed, have everything I wanted. Um, but they taught me to, you know, value money and that money's not everything. My mom and dad kind of have separate goal, separate views on this. Um, but I think they taught me to, you know, enjoy what you have and you don't need, you don't need this kind of, I think nowadays we have this Instagram totally screwed up people. It's just, yep. just fake. It's fake. The, my whole brand's about, it's fictional affluence. It's just smoke and mirrors everywhere. And it's, it's sad because I, I don't know how old you are. I'm 25 and 26. Yeah. You feel you, I mean, you, if you buy into it, there's a lot of pressure because you see all these people living this extravagant life. And if you really buy into it, which it, it's all smoke and mirrors, it's stressful because you, you want like a, you want everything that you see. Um, but anyway, I'm rambling on, but yeah, I very humble beginnings. Um, but I had everything I wanted. I had a great childhood financially. So. I'm very lucky. No, and I, I think you're spot on there with social media. I mean, Instagram makes people want, hey, everyone's traveling, doing this and that. And I want that. I want that car. I want that nice vacation. And it causes a lot of societal pressure. It causes a lot of depression, anxiety. It causes a lot of time just wasting sitting there scrolling. It causes issues. And you don't know what people's, what's actually going on in their life. You don't know the ins and outs of it. You don't know their financial situation. You don't know what's happening at home. Um, but it's all perfect on social media. A lot of people go on vacations and post this and that, and you don't know the true underlining of their finances or, hey, how can they afford that nice new car? Little do you know that they might be in a wad of credit card debt or a car loan. And yeah. that's why also I started this podcast is because a lot of people don't realize that, that, hey, I'm going on a vacation on credit card debt. It's not that bad. It's just a little bit of credit card debt or it's just a $500 a month car loan. But when you look at the bigger, bigger reality of it and look at their net worth, look at their assets, look at their income, it's like, this is a problem. And these are habits that continue with you throughout life if you don't change now. And that's why I started this because I want to just instill more knowledge in people and help them realize that, hey, you can take action and change now. And your pretty reality might not be as pretty when you look at it. And a lot of people decide to have the flashy, flaunty Instagram when, and just ignore their financial reality. And that's not a, in my opinion, a good way to go about doing life because it's gonna catch up to you one day or the other, whether you like it or not. Um, so again, just trying to start this channel, help people learn, grow and, yeah, no, social media has caused a lot of issues with that so honestly as as uh, someone who has an mba in finance wow. i i don't know if i would tell someone go get an mba in finance i think tools like what you do with your show i think youtube i think it's extremely powerful if you put your mind to it and you it's tough because there's other distractions out there and and they're all on your phone and it's tough to kind of just hone in on one but i think the internet nowadays is tremendous um, I think podcasts are obviously booming and I think there's just so much knowledge out there. If you want to learn, you can learn and it's, it's all free. Yeah. There's a lot of, a lot of great resources out there. There's also a lot of trash out there where people say, Hey, get rich quick, do this, go, go buy or go arbitrage an Airbnb on a credit card. Nothing can go wrong. Or, Hey, you want a free Rolex? Go max out business credit cards. Uh, take a line of credit for that, whatever, sell the Rolex bankruptcy, your, uh, well, company, see. and then just keep the $80,000 Rolex. And it's like, a lot of trash out there as well, which is the unfortunate reality of social media. I didn't. I know. I know that. But yeah, it's like the the quote: "Can't believe everything you see on the internet." Abe Lincoln. Exactly. Um, so, growing up, did your parents talk to you much about money? Did they talk about budgeting, about their finances, or teach you about money at all? My mom. My parents are still married, but my mom just doesn't want to talk about money. She's just. It's not her forte. She doesn't doesn't say it it doesn't define you it doesn't it's important but it's not everything um and my dad is more of the finance guy 
Um, but we never talked about like how much my father made growing up. Um, my mom was a nurse and then she retired and now she's like my dad's uh, assistant kind of. But we never really talked about like salary and stuff. Um, you know, I I knew that I had everything I needed and I was lucky, but it wasn't wasn't talked about. No, it was kind of I guess it was a little taboo because my dad saw that my mom never wanted to talk about it. And, you know, we just never did. But I think now that I got my MBA in finance, I started a clothing brand. We talk about it more openly as a family. But no, we did not talk about finances when I was younger. And that, that's the problem in most families in America because parents either want to shelter their kids from financial mistakes or problems that might be going through, don't want to scare them or worry them, um, or they just don't want information to necessarily share them. And same way growing up, I think my parents started talking more about money when I started my first business and I started asking them questions and being just curious about things. Didn't know what I was doing. My dad would start helping me learn about finances, how to kind of run um, income statements with the business, how to start investing money when I first uh, started having money to be able to invest and started talking a lot more openly about that when I was about 16 years old. And throughout the last 10 years, we've talked a lot about money because I like talking about money and like asking questions. And um, that's why I started this podcast because I'm passionate about it. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. I, I talk about it basically at every family function these days. I always ask him about questions or ask family members or just have something to say about about money. So because um, I'm just trying to learn. So that's it's important. That, that, and I think it's that you said it's not just taboo with my family. I think it's taboo with a lot of people and kind of weird when you think about it. I think the taboo almost puts more pressure on it. It's only going to help people. You know, it's either going to teach them what not to do with scams, with credit card debt, with stuff not how to not live life, and or it's going to teach them how to live life. So I, it's, I think it's great on both sides. 100%. 100%. So let's talk about your current monthly expenses that you sent over. So right now we have net income, roughly $4,500 a month after taxes. Um, we have gas, $100 a month. There's no car payment. No. Nope. Beautiful. Um, car insurance costs. Uh, yeah, I didn't put that in there. Probably... Uh, I don't know, 500 bucks a year. Pretty cheap, $40 a month. Mine's about $100 a month, um, my car insurance. But um, groceries, don't spend any money on groceries? No, I do. Um, I thought, it, did I not put that in there? No. Oh, I would say probably, I try to eat pretty clean, um, which sadly is expensive. I would say I probably spend, um, I would say I probably spend maybe 70 bucks every two weeks. Okay, so 140 a month on groceries. Every month, yeah, because I, I get to I eat with you know with work and stuff a lot, a lot of expense dinners and stuff. Okay, and sounds like you're living at home right now, so no um, housing expenses. No housing expenses. Okay, so that brings total necessities about two eighty one, and then we got subscriptions. You have zero eating out, two hundred entertainment, three hundred health and fitness, two twelve personal care, thirty two. So your total fund money about seven forty four. So brings your total monthly expenses to about a thousand twenty five dollars a month. Does that sound about right? So you typically have about three thousand three thousand five hundred dollars left over each month. Yeah, and I I try to just put everything away. Nice. Okay. Well, good. A lot of room for uh for margin for investing for saving with that. So taking advantage of it while while you can, which is great. So what's your current plan right now or current structure and strategy for budgeting your money? That's a great question because I. I'm very unconventional, and I think I, I you know, kind of hinted at that when talking about my savings account. I kind of just, I put, I'm not a giving financial advice, but it works for me, and I've seen my net worth grow over the last year just by doing this. But I, I put, I, I somewhat budget a little bit. Okay, I have, you know, I, I'm gonna, I have this gig coming up. I know I'm gonna get paid for this, and. I kind of forecast it, which is not a good thing to do. You know, you never count your eggs before they hatch, but I kind of treat it like a game. I, whatever I make, I know I can kind of forecast for the future and I try to put a lot of it away and then leave myself with very little in checking and just kind of live off that. Like I said, I'm not condoning this, but it works for me because I know that I can just take it out of savings immediately. And I have not taken, I've not touched my investment accounts uh, in, I think since last Christmas. Okay. So right now strategy, try to keep just as low amount of money in your checking account, stock it away, live off of that. This is really bad. I think just, just, I don't, I, I don't drink anymore. So Miami is big party scene. You know, I, I don't spend money on liquor. Um, I don't, like to go to the fancy dinners and stuff. So I don't necessarily go out much. I'm, I have a pretty just relaxing lifestyle. Yeah. I'm single. So it's on date night, 
Um, I guess kind of just like simple with money. I like, I like having money. I don't like spending money. I like having it. You know, I like looking at it and as I like seeing it grow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think my one suggestion would be if your strategy is obviously it seems to be working right now, if you have money left every each month, but I would suggest is finding a budgeting tool that you like. I use something called mint. There's stuff like copilot every dollar, um, or you can use Google spreadsheets, but would suggest is like setting up a budget because you also never know how much money you're spending last month on food or on shopping or whatever it might be, unless you actually track it. Yeah, and yeah. a lot of people are shocked when they start budgeting their money every single month and realize, hey, I spent $500 shopping at Amazon last month. Or um, people are like, hey, I'm living paycheck to paycheck. And then they you look through their finances and they got hundreds of dollars with DoorDash. And yeah. they don't realize that, hey, I spent $400 last month on DoorDash when I got credit card debt. And unless you're actually tracking your money, then you're not going to know that, hey, those $20 transactions, those $50 transactions, those $30 transactions add up to being hundreds of dollars every single month. And so my one suggestion on the budgeting side is what's working for you right now is great, but if you move out, have an apartment, have rent, whatever it might be, stuff happens or you want to start traveling more, then that money needs to be tracked. You need to be very intentional about it. And I saw there was a comparison one time. And I was like, when you have to be like intentional about where you how you spend your money and create a budget because it's a lot like counting calories and trying to lose weight or sticking to a diet, if you kind of stray from that, you're going to just start instilling those bad habits again. So if you kind of have a budget and have that plan and you stick to it, then you're going to see success. You're going to see yourself living below your means. You can be very cognizant of when you're online shopping or when you're grocery shopping that you're buying just what you need because you know, okay, I only have $100 left for groceries this month. I can't go spend $130 this week. I can only go spend 95 or just under 100 Um, So my one suggestion would be start budgeting your money, track it, yeah. Um, right now with your expenses so low, sounds like you don't spend that much money in Miami that you can get by with this, but kind of, it's good to start instilling those habits in you now, because if you get married, if you have kids and you go through that, just trying to live the way that you are, it's going to be a lot more stressful when you have more expenses, when you have children, when you have a partner, um, and those expenses start growing, you have rent and it's good to start setting those, um, habits up now versus, Hey, let's wait until I'm 30 or 40 to start trying to instill those habits in yourself. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, I think that's why I'm kind of most excited about the corporate opportunity is because of the structure. I think the income structure, I'll know I'll have more of like a steady stream. And, um, I mean, I work a lot. I, I modeling has picked up and I don't take from the clothing brand, but I work a lot with this family. So I kind of, I know what's coming in. Um, but it's, up and down, I mean, travel and stuff. So I think I'm mo- I'm most excited about corporate is because of the structure and okay, I know this paycheck's coming in base, say a commission's commission, but I know base is coming in. So I think I'm gonna get ready to start like a, a strict budget. Yeah. And I would suggest do it even before that happens because a lot of people say, oh, I'm gonna wait until I'm making $100,000 or I'm gonna wait till this happens. And guess what? They continue those bad habits and then they continue those bad habits never change. Or you look at it in America right now, a lot of people say, hey, I'll start budgeting. I'll start paying off debt when I'm making $100,000. Well, 49% of people in America making over $100,000 living paycheck to paycheck. And that's because they have bad habits that they kept with them when they were making $50,000 when they started their career and just continue those with you. So same way with budgeting for yourself right now, I'd say, hey, don't wait until you have that job. Start now. And yes, you'll have more consistent income, be more predictable when um, you have that income, but right now start to those habits and start figuring out, okay, what is your monthly spending? So when you're not just waiting for that perfect moment, perfect day, cause there's never a perfect moment, perfect day to, to start. So uh, yeah, I appreciate that. So let's dive into monthly expenses. Then I know you sent over some different screenshots and I'll kind of go through here and see what we have. So last month we had $1,900 and $1,988 worth of purchases on this, it looks like Advantage credit card. Yeah, so I, I, a lot of those are business expenses for the family. Okay, so they reimburse you for? Totally, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I tried to pick personal expenses, but I, yeah, all those are reimbursed. Okay, have you ever thought about having like a separate account? I guess you might be leaving this family soon too if you're going to work in corporate America, but having a separate account to kind of keep those separate where this is your personal stuff, and so you're not to dig add through one, transactions. Add one, and then uh, this credit. I just, I started traveling more, so I just wanted to rack up the miles to the family. Okay. Yeah, I had just like a, a you know a work credit card. Yeah. Okay. So I guess it'd be hard to pick and choose what's 
um, for them or not. What is, I and mean, we have at least $300 at cigar lounges and cigars for last month. Huh. So that that's for you or the family. That's for, that's for my best friend. Who's the finance guy. He has a cigar brand and he ran out of inventory and I needed to buy some from one of his online suppliers so he could fulfill an order. Okay. Nice friend spending $300 for him on oh, us. He, he reimbursed me too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Besides that in here, we got Whole Foods, Chipotle, Publix. Yeah, that's me. Sounds about right. More Chipotle. You like Chipotle, Starbucks, Whole Foods, Panera, Starbucks. Um, I mean, with your income, I'm not not too worried about if some of that is coming from the family and being reimbursed. I'm not too worried about spending $2,000. You're still well below your means. Don't have any living expenses. But I would say figure out how can you kind of separate that out? How can you differentiate that? Because kind of throwing this into a mint budget or co-pilot and you have call it $1,500 or $1,000 that you're getting reimbursed, then it's going to kind of definitely throw that for a loop. So figuring out how can you kind of separate that out? Or if you create a budget in there that when you get paid, you put that same income or reimbursement back in that category so it offsets it. Um, but would we'll definitely just suggest trying to figure out how to kind of differentiate that a little bit so you can understand your personal finances a little bit better because looking at this right now, obviously I, I don't know what all these different expenses are, what they are, but I would assume that if you go through here and you're trying to count how much to actually spend on, at Publix or grocery stores or eating out and some of those are intermixed, it's going to cause you a headache to calculate that and understand how much money you spent last month on things. But yeah, I mean, overall, nothing, nothing too crazy besides, I guess I saw, like I said, the um, cigar stuff and then... A lot of different eating out stuff. Yeah, um, a lot of that's a lot were you, of that's, were you in France? I was in France, yeah. That was for my sister's thirtieth birthday. So that was kind of an outlier too. Okay. Yeah, I mean ma mainly eating out charges. So I would depend on how much are reimbursed or not, but when we have two hundred dollars for eating out, I would presume there's between grocery stores and eating out, there's at least four hundred, five hundred. Here's a tuna place, Tokyo tuna for eighty five dollars. Um I would definitely say your food spending is a lot higher than Two hundred fifty dollars. Like personal expenses for the food, like a lot of that's free. Yeah, but you know, only I would know that. But yeah, yeah. So we definitely just start budget would be be the suggestion, but that makes sense. I mean, overall, your spending most of being reimbursed is, is not bad, especially for your income. Look higher than they are. Personal expenses look higher than they are because it is just my personal credit card. Yeah. Well, let's let's dive into the investing aspect of this. So, what are your goals investing wise? What are the current things that you're invested in? Um, mainly single stocks. Yeah, mainly single. I wanted to, single stocks versus index funds. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, what are your thoughts on IRAs? Um, I think Roth IRAs are great things to be maxing out and contributing to. Um, I would definitely suggest anyone ever that can do it. That's a great place to start because it's tax free dollars when when you're able to withdraw. Um, and even if you're over the income threshold, you can do a backdoor Roth. So Roth IRAs are definitely suggest doing that 100%. Um, yeah, I haven't opened up mine yet. I think that's my next move. This is probably an IRA. You, you'd max it out for this year. Yeah. Like $6,000 6, or $6,500. Uh, I think it's going up to 7000 next year. I think they bumped it to sixty five and then seven. Yeah, this year is 6500 Next year is uh, 7000 So definitely would suggest that get on that today. Get on it. Max it out for this year. Because, I mean, if you... If you just alone from now until by the time you're 67, put in $500 a month, nothing else. If you've got like 541, and again, those contribution limits are going to go up $1.64 million tax free dollars. So, no IRS tax bill on that, nothing. Straight and clear your money. So, I would definitely do that. I mean, even then, you can withdraw it. I think 59 and a half tax free. And Roth IRAs, too, you can withdraw your contributions tax free, no penalties. You can't take, um, the gains on it tax free or penalty free early, but there's a lot of different uh, bonuses of doing that. So um, definitely would suggest get on that, start doing it, and that will pay off a lot over the long term. I mean, frankly, you want to know the difference between starting your Roth IRA today, this year versus next year? On interest is crazy. It'd be so if you started this year, it'd be 1.646 million. If you do it next year, get one less year. 1.529. So it's over $100,000 just by putting in $6,000 this year. And guess what? You have, if you have cash at Robin account, you can pull that out, put that in a Roth, open up Roth IRA, put that in there immediately. Guess what? Same thing, tax, post tax dollars, but guess what? There's no capital gains on. Might do that tomorrow. I, I got, I'm, I'm pretty liquid in Robin Hood. Yeah. So definitely something I'll look at, and that would definitely uh, help you there. So my sister's, though, she's five years older than me. She's a uh, corporate attorney in Manhattan. She's definitely the more structured, conventional way of doing things. So she's been on me to, 
set up my Roth IRA for a while and maybe you'll be the one that makes you pull the trigger. I'm just gonna call your sister. Hey, some random guy on the internet convinced me to open my Roth IRA today. He told me it's gonna cost me a hundred thousand dollars in the next well, 40 makes, years. So I, I'm changing. If you, it, if you put it in those terms, it kind of lights a fire. I mean, it's a hundred thousand dollar mistake if you don't do it this year. Yep. Um, so in that Robinhood account, mainly single stocks? Yeah. Mainly single stocks, yeah. Okay. Do you do any index funds or ETFs or mutual funds? I do not. Okay. What What is causing you to do that besides your friend? Yeah, honestly, it's just not pulling the trigger yet. I think I got, I mean, this isn't, I, I got not burned, but potential gains. I got burned early on and then I kind of just kept my money there because I didn't want to pull the trigger. And then Robinhood, you know, was giving me 5% and I kind of just I put, 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 put money away there and I see, you know, just interest accruing and I just haven't pulled the trigger yet. Well, what's, st what's stopping you from, invest what's your reason to put in single stocks if you say an Apple or Amazon or whatever versus put into like an S&P 500 fund or put into like a broad market fund or put in into uh, index funds that track NASDAQ, the S&P 500? I'm totally honest with you. I think the, the short-term gratification of the individuals, potential gratification of the individual stock. Do you know um, what percentage of actively managed like funds, mutual funds beat the five-year, 10-year, 20-year like benchmarks? Um, sure, but it's very low. So, so I'm saying actively managed mutual funds. So these people that are actively managing mutual funds that are- oh, they're not, not, not ETFs and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so they're act actually managed mutual funds that are trying to like, okay, we're trying to beat the S&P 500 or we're trying to no, beat the NASDAQ. 95% of um, active managed funds underperform benchmarks after 20 years. I, I, I flipped yeah. it around, but yeah. And and my point of that is, I mean, I, I definitely have gotten caught up in the individual stocks before. I've made a lot of money investing in individual stocks. And I've also lost a lot of money. And I realized, hey, when I started losing, I, I cut a lot of my losses um, and realize that, hey, I'm not the next Warren Buffett. I'm not going to sit and read P&Ls, income statements. I'm not going to bet on a CEO that I don't know who it is. Um, and all my money moving forward is going into index funds that are tracking different indexes. And if I'm earning 7 to seven, 10% returns on average, and guess what? I'll, I'll be doing okay. I'm not going to sit here and outperform people that do this for a living, trying to do it in actively managed funds. If they can't do it, why do I think I can? Got it. So something I would suggest look more into what is the risk versus reward and maybe it is okay you want to keep investing some in individual stocks and again i i still have some money in individual stocks that i put in over the last few years i cut my losses on a lot of my dumb gains but some of the bigger companies that i'm like okay i think this is a good long-term play um i do have some of my money on there but it's a smaller allocation of my portfolio but maybe it's like okay look at allocating 90 percent of your money into more of index funds etfs and then the remaining amount that you want to mess around and do with single stocks and okay, that could be a good uh, investing strategy for you. And that's really coming up what you want to do and decide. But I definitely suggest not having 100% of your money in single stocks because look at the top 20 companies 20 years from now or 25 years ago, majority of those are not in the top 20, 25 companies today in terms of market share. I mean, Google, I think, just celebrated its 25th birthday. So 30 years ago, when people were investing in single stocks, Google wasn't even around. Facebook wasn't around. So definitely would suggest of, hey, looking at alternatives that so you're not just betting your entire future on single stocks. And obviously there's a lot of people that make money in single stocks. I mean, I know people have made, I know someone that made hundreds of thousands of dollars on GameStop. And then I also know equally as many people that have lost thousands or tens of thousands of dollars on GameStop because they got caught in that stuff. I know someone else that lost $80,000 on GameStop, but I know someone else that made $100,000. And it's like, you have, for every winner you hear, there's dozens and dozens of losers. And um, in the, tech world in this back world, I was definitely one of those losers. I thought I was up. I was up on some of my stocks and I was like, oh, doubled in under a month. It's going to keep going. Why would I sell now? Guess what? Nine months later, it's down 90%. So learned the lesson the hard way. And from that point on, I was like, I looked at my wife and I said, I definitely got a little too carried away with this. And uh, definitely, I mean, that is a, what I did was, I don't even want to know, probably a seven figure mistake over the next 40 years, if it compounded correctly. Yeah, it, um, yeah. And I learned the hard way. And now I got to just move move on and realize that, hey, this is the best route for me. And it might not be, I might not earn a Warren Buffett compound return of 30% over the next 40 years. But I know if I average seven to 10% or whatever the market's doing, hopefully, if I'm investing in good funds, then um, guess what? I'll be okay. I'll be set up very nicely for, for life. My kids will, my family will. Something happens to me, my wife will. Um, but I'm not gambling my my future and my family's future on that. So definitely, yeah. No, I I, I mean that's 
I think the, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago and the second best time is tomorrow. So I think I definitely have flacked on that for sure. Yeah. I mean, the Roths and the ETFs. Yeah. I, I think I've gotten complacent kind of just seeing it, just my uninvested cash. I've kind of gotten complacent just seeing it there and it's pretty, it's a safe bet. Um, yeah. you know, just, and I think I think, oh, I'm going to have this here for a big play in an individual stock. And I just haven't, I just week by week goes by. And timing, I just, timing the market is very, very difficult thing to no, do. No, not even, well, I mean, yeah, I hinted at that, but I think I just get, I'm just getting comfortable seeing my little interest grow Yeah, and you know, it's and, safe, but. And what you can do too is set up, what I do too is like, I don't even have to think about it is I set up automatic recurring investments. So I put in money, it pulls my bank account every single month, every single week, basically and puts into different index funds that we have allocated them for. And guess what? I never have to touch thing, never have to look at it and um, have some cash in a Vanguard account that's earning 5%. But guess what? Every single week, it's auto-investing that. And whether I think the market's going to go up or down in the next six months, it's still earning that 5% until it gets invested. So if the market goes up a couple percent, guess what? It's still earning a little bit of interest. The market goes down, still earning interest before it gets invested. So um, going that route, I think, is keeping money in a high-yield savings account or in money market accounts, whatever you decide on, um, doing something like that and then auto investing it so that you don't have to think about it. Don't have to worry about timing the market. It'll set you up for success and not have to wait for the perfect moment. Same thing with the perfect moment. It was in, um, 2018. This was a, probably over time will be a six figure mistake, but I had hundred thousand dollars sitting in a CD earning 2% interest, two or 3%, because I was like 2018, we're going to have a stock market crash. We're gonna have a stock market crash. Guess what? Didn't happen. I came to put it in, in 2020, at the end of 2020, beginning of 2021. Guess what? Down my money then. So if I had been auto investing it in 2018, 2019, even if over six months or 12 months, I'd have been a heck of a lot better off than putting it in at the top of 2021 into 2020. So <laughs> um, I like your point about the auto investing. I think that's good just mentally too, because it, it, I'm speaking for myself, but at the beginning when I first started investing, I remember I started with $5,000 and I was looking at it every day and it gets you consume it and i think money back to our first conversation is taboo and money doesn't buy happiness um and i think that rich people have problems poor people have problems but my point of this is that i think that auto investing is good for your sanity because you kind of just let it do its thing and you don't it's not a it's you can't check it every day you just can't i thought i could and it was fun in the beginning but you, you just can't so i think as Someone who doesn't do it, I think I would be a big proponent for that um, because mentally it just, it consumes you. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of people are typically scared to invest too, don't know where to start. And there's a lot of platforms out there that are made a lot easier. Acorns is a great one. I've gotten some friends, got my wife and I, she was doing 401k stuff, but got her to start using the Acorns app and it starts out really showing, has really cool illustrations like, okay, you're planning your acorns today was gonna be a giant tree 40 years from now gotcha and just shows you the power of compound interest and like that just got her first week start putting five dollars in next week ten dollars and just can do that for a few weeks get comfortable and then you're like okay i can live without that fifty dollars i can live without that a hundred dollars that month and it just gets pulled automatically never have to think about it you wake up 12 months later and there's a lot more money in it and you're like wow i can do this now i can up it even more next paycheck let's up it even more um, so tools like that have made it a lot more accessible and then allow you to just forget about it. Cause a lot of people are like, oh, I need to wait till I have $10,000 to invest or $5,000 to invest. But no, you start small with what you can from your paycheck. Everyone cut out $20 in expenses in the last month. You, you didn't need that Chipotle. You didn't need that extra chocolate bar, whatever it might be, extra drink at the bar, put that into a recurring investment app and do that for a month, do that for two months, whatever, and just continue to grow it and um invest more as you can but it gets you just at least in that habit of doing it so you never forget that so and everyone's finances are different you know everyone has different situations health wise family wise but as someone who i you know i not conventional and i i have to learn um and i you know definitely have room to grow but my for your followers i would say it gets addicting in a good way and like just put that put that ten dollars away put the twenty dollars away um i'm very competitive so i kind of take it like a game against myself but if my one take from like you said some random guy on the internet just start investing it's it's fun it's you know you like you just said about your fiance at the time it's a it's a tree and just start it's it's fun you'll love it um and i thank myself now for little investments i made six months ago so just imagine in 10, 15, 20 years now. Yeah, 
Exactly. Just just have to start, whether it's you're trying to start a new diet, you're trying to start a business, you're trying to invest, you got to start and start small. Yep. Do your research, learn, learn about different things, learn about what you're going to invest you into before you do it, learn about your business before you do it, learn about your diet before you do it, but educate yourself first and then start taking action on it. Small baby steps, whether it's $5 a month, $10 a month, $5 a week, whatever it is, just get in the habit of that and educate yourself and you're going to thank yourself 10, 20, 30 years from now. So Absolutely. Well, oh, John, what is um, what do you think your biggest financial mistake is that you've made? Oh, please. Um, I would say probably budgeting. I really am glad we talked about that, and I need to sit down and actually do that. I think budgeting because I give myself a good grade because I know what money is coming in, and I know it's not just it's not just coming from anybody else. I'm, you know, I'm lucky enough to still live at home, but I am – kind of self-sufficient on any fun expenses, eating, any anything like that. So I know that I have money coming in um, and I know I have money being saved that's myself, that's due to myself. But I think budgeting, because like I said, I think I'm doing a good job, but we don't know where I could, I don't need that there. I don't need that there. You know, I can, if I, I think if I broke it down and actually saw the numbers of, oh, I'm, I'm spending a little too much there unnecessarily, I think that would help me, uh, I got a few recommendations for you before we wrap this up here and budgeting first and foremost, that was what was my number one recommendation is, is budget. Make sure that you're just tracking everything, try to separate stuff from what you're doing for work versus the personal, just to make it a little bit easier on yourself. Um, number two, emergency fund, especially as you look to, if you're ever moving out, getting your own place, you need to make sure you're having your own emergency fund built up. That's apart from your investment account. Cause I don't want you to be pulling stuff from your Robinhood account or saying, Hey, I have the ability to pull from your investment account because People say, oh, I have the ability to pull from my 401k. I have the ability to pull from this and it just leads to bad habits. Or I have the ability to put it on a credit card and pay it off in a month. And that's just bad habits to set. So I don't want you to get even in the mindset of, hey, I'm going to pull from my my uh, my investment account. So separate that from your investment account. Put in a high yield savings account, 4 or 5%. And don't fret on whether it's 4.5% or 5% because half a percent, even on $100,000 is $500 a year. And you're not going to put in $100,000 in an emergency fund. So don't fret about that put it away, put it aside. Most people suggest three to six months of an emergency fund. I like building it up to six months plus. Um, but as your living expenses increase, make sure you're just padding that and have that separate from the investments. And then learn more about the ETF side, index funds, um, single stocks. Yes, it can be fun. can be kind of a game, can be glorifying when times are great, but it's also terrible when the times are tough because all that is outside of your control. Obviously, like the US economy or the total world economy, stock market is outside your control. But you at least de-risk when you're invested in dozens of companies or hundreds of companies, bits and pieces of those with index funds because they're just baskets of companies versus, hey, all, all in on one company. Um, and don't make this a $100,000 mistake. Don't start your Roth IRA next year. Start it this year. It's $100,000 tax-free versus, hey, you put that in right now, put it in a taxable brokerage account. I mean, you're going to be, yes, you're going to be okay. It still will grow hopefully the same rate of return if it's in the same index fund, in theory it would, but you're going to be paying capital gains taxes on it. Yep. So make sure you're going to have a taxable gain of over $100,000, which will capital gain taxes be then? Will it still be 15%, 20%? Um, we don't know. So might as well take advantage of the Roth IRA, start doing it now, start maxing out every single year. And that's a $100,000 difference starting it this year versus next year. That will be in your balance when you're 67. So really think right now you're setting yourself up for success, living life living well below your means, continue to do that. And awesome to see your net worth. It should cross a hundred thousand dollars in the next two months. If you continue to save and live the way that you are, uh, but really do just appreciate you coming on here that and um, being transparent and having open, honest conversations. So. Of course. Yeah. It's, it's, it's tough sometimes, but you, you got to do it. it. I think it, it keeps yourself accountable. You know, a lot of us get this mindset that we're doing better or worse than we are. And I think it's good to just, you know, look at the numbers, um, because sometimes you don't give yourself enough credit. Sometimes you, you know, overlook things. So I think it's, it's it was fun to, you know, sit down and look at my finances and, you know, crunch some numbers. So I appreciate the invite. It was fun.